Hello, it's good to see everyone. It's also good for us to be in our own cozy homes, except me, I'm in my own cozy office. Um, if you haven't stopped by, love to meet you here at some point. Um, hope you are all well and that you had a chance to maybe rest a little bit this weekend. Really had a um, lovely bar mitzvah here. It was great to see so many people. And um, Avi and I are looking forward to a lovely Shabbat service Friday night and Saturday. And Friday night this week, we have a potluck dinner. It's being hosted by Ellen. Ellen, you're not doing it alone, right? No, I'm doing it with Pam Seifman. Um, but it just means that we'd love for people to come bring a dairy dish and then join us for Davin for, for services first, if you want, or just Shabbat dinner. On Saturday, um, Avi and I are going to start experimenting with helping our services to feel a little shorter and actually to be a little shorter, but also to feel um, a little bit more participatory. So you'll notice on Saturday, maybe even Friday, that we're moving where we're leading the davening from because we want it to be an experience where people are davening, praying along with us, um, and that there's not a sense of performing in any way. So I'm going to do a little bit of experimenting the next few weeks while we don't have B'nai Mitzvah. Um, I want to thank those of you who were here last week and who came back this week, and those of you who are can't be here, but you're watching on the Zoom, not on the Zoom, on the recording, which it is recording. I mean, I, I, I thank those of you who called me during the week or who brought things up during um, Shabbat services that didn't get dealt with last week. And one of them I'm going to save for a conversation later tonight. The topic of that was a question was asked towards the end of last week. Well, if the definition of how things change in Judaism changes so rapidly, who decides what Jewish action is and what is authentically Jewish? Is it Gila or Allison or Michelle or me? Is it all of us? Is it Jewish tradition in general? Is it the Jewish community in general? So we will spend some time speaking about how Jewish life gets determined. That's A. B, tonight really is a little bit more at the beginning of us talking. So if you're able to be on screen, we would appreciate being on screen tonight as much as you can. Um, so last week was just really an introduction. And tonight we're talking about something called a signature mitzvah. So um, actually, we'll start with a bracha. The bracha is La'asok b'divrei Torah. And if you'd like to join me in this bracha, you're welcome to, or you're welcome to just think about what does it mean to be busy with mitzvot? Busy, busy, asuk, osek b'mitzvah, or asuk b'mitzvah. Isn't that interesting? I can't turn that off because I'm in my office. So join with me. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotam v'tzivanu, La'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, sovereign source of all, who commands us to be busy with mitzvot, occupied in doing mitzvot. Amen. So this is really, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion first before we go to what I believe are incredibly scintillating, beautiful texts from Martin Buber and from the Ishbitzer Rebbe um, and a few other texts that are amazing, but the two of those texts were my faves. So here's the question. I'd like to invite you to think about what your signature mitzvah might be. And then how did you come up with this idea of what your signature mitzvah is? Now you might say, Andy, Rabbi, Tova, however you call me, I don't know what a signature mitzvah is. Fair point. You might also say, 
I don't have a signature mitzvah, a mitzvah or a signature, either one. But I'd like to go into this not defining what signature mitzvah is. I'd like you just to think about, reflect, what would your signature mitzvah be? And how did you come to that? So I think, remember last week I asked you to um, bring, a, bring a pad of paper or an iPad or something you could write on. So we'll ask you to take a couple minutes and do that. We also want to welcome the newlywed back, Shruthi, who I see here, probably from California. Hi, yes. California, our newlywed, great. We love that you've re, um, re-engaged with us. So again, I'm gonna ask for maybe a couple moments really for us to do our own journaling and reflection in that journal that I asked you to bring. I also have paper and I'm also gonna answer for myself. So what is your signature mitzvah? And how did you come to that? What is your signature mitzvah? And how did you come to that? And I'm not gonna define that signature mitzvah for you. I'm gonna ask you to sort of think that through yourself. So, um, bon atril, let's, let's begin. And I'm gonna give people about two and a half minutes or so. Okay. <laughs> Are people mostly done? So great. I'm hoping that people can share and that we can also, I know this is being taped. So that's a little, actually, maybe we stop the tape for the, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. All right. We'll keep the tape going. So our signature mitzvah, who, I'm going to ask people who don't usually speak to begin so that we get lots of voices everyone will be able to participate and um Suzanne do you want to put them in the chat for us or what do you think great and then we'll save that okay who's gonna be the Nachshon um okay so is it Rini Rini (laughs) Rini then Gila okay um and reading what what was in the text for tonight um I realized that I don't have a particular um, mitzvah, a signature mitzvah. I try to make myself available when help is needed. So maybe my signature mitzvah is being available. But I don't have a you know particular thing. Gila, would you go? So I think my uh, signature mitzvah is to teach the Torah. Now, my definition is the Torah is a little different than yours because you... Uh, I thought you're that. Uh, 
you said, divrei Torah mitzvot, lasok bedivrei Torah, lasok bemitzvot. So my definition is wider, and divrei Torah for me is everything Jewish, including history, including everything uh, that has to do with uh, Jewish life, and that's my signature mitzvah. Thank you. And how did you come to that? That's a long story. You need uh, two hours for that. One day I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, Ellen and Nancy are laughing because they know. <laughs> right? Okay. So, but you came to it. It wasn't... I came to it. Yeah. Um. Okay, so Edie's going. Everyone's going to go because this is about our discussion of what our signature meets vote are. Thank you, and uh, glad to be joining all of you. So uh, thank okay. you for having me. Um, I, I put down, uh, not knowing the definition of what a signature mitzvah is, um, I put down that my signature mitzvah is all about helping children learn about helping others in meaningfully beneficial ways to sort of teach children about uh, tikkun olam and repairing the world. Okay. And I came to that mitzvah when my daughter was little and wanted to help her and her classmates when they were super little, when they were you know, three, four, five years old, um, wanted to help her and her classmates learn about mitzvot. So my friend Marcy and I started this group called Mini, Mit Mini Mitzvah Corps. And that, I, you know, it, it kind of went dormant during COVID, but that was, it, that was kind of what I would call my signature mitzvah because I wanted to te help teach children ways that they could be helpful in ways that would actually help other organizations and not be like a burden to the organization to have a bunch of like little five-year-olds kind of traipsing through and it'd be like more trouble than it was worth to the organization. And so that's, that's what I think it is. Like, I really like helping children. I don't get enough time to do it in my day job. So that's what I really like to do. So it, your, your signature meets at a rose came to you by fulfilling a need in your life that you weren't able to do more with kids and then you saw this need. Yep. Okay, so that, okay, who's next? Ever, I'd love everyone to go. So actually, Ellen and then Sam Daly Harris, if you could go. Okay, so I, mine was uh, deciding to observe kashrut all the time. I had uh, decided to make my home kosher and then decided to observe it, not only at home, but all the time. And I came to it in the mid, I grew up in a non-observant home, certainly not kosher at all. Uh, I came to it in the mid eighties at my synagogue in Atlanta. I was in services and our rabbi had just come back from a trip to the Soviet Union. Hmm. And he spoke about who had to smuggle in mezuzot and sidorim and how the Jews, the Soviet Jews could not observe their religion in any way, shape or form that was visible. And I was like, in the, like lightning struck. And I said, you know, I can, I can observe Kashrut in my country any, if I want to. So I decided I was going to do that. I was going to observe it all the time for a year. I was going to give it a year to show as a chat, you know, just to show my support of the Soviet Jews. And that, as I said, was in the mid eighties and I'm still observing Kashrut all the time. So it came to you, you tried it on for size. <laughs> you saw if it fit for a while, you wore it for a little bit before you mm -hmm. decided to own it. Okay. Right. Yeah. So Sam. Okay, great. Hi, uh, let's see. My signature mitzvah is, um, training organizations and individuals in transformational advocacy, not transactional, sign the petition, done, but transformational where you see yourself in a new light as a result of your advocacy. And how do I do a 35 second version of how I came to it? This is what I've done for 43 years. So the death of a high school friend in AZA in 1964 around high school graduation, the death of Robert Kennedy around college graduation in 68, got me to asking the questions of purpose. Why am I here? What am I here to do? 
uh, a presentation on world hunger in 77 uh, got me to realize that I wasn't hopeless about the lack of solutions. I was hopeless about human nature, that people would just never get around to doing what could be done. There was one human nature I had some control over. I got involved. I spoke to 7,000 high school students at the end of the 70s and re read quotes calling for the political will to end world hunger and found that fewer than 3% of the students that I asked could tell me the name of their member of Congress and 97% could not. And that was my route into my signature mitzvah. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Myra, then Mike. Okay, my signature mitzvah is comforting the mourner. And I came to that uh, when my mother died in 1974. And we had just moved to the East Windsor community and had a gotten involved with the community. So I felt very isolated and alone when I was sitting Shiva. And we, we hardly had a minion. I don't even know if we had it. So after that, I volunteered when we joined the synagogue to do Shiva meals. And that's something I've done continuously or have recently picked up here. Is it something that is meaningful to me? Mike? Uh, yes, I, uh, when I had, send out personal emails, at the end of the email, I put blessings only. It's have people understand that, uh, that there is some good in the world and uh, this, is, this is happening all the time. And I can't do much more than that right now, but I am on the, as the Jewish Center, I'm on the committees of uh, the Lifelong Learning Committee and the uh, right. So your signature affairs. So your signature mitzvah is to send blessings to others. Yes, That's really beautiful. Thank you. Okay, um, who hasn't gone? Who could go? What's your signature mitzvah? How'd you get there? So Mickey, Fran, Jane, Lana, then Michelle. I, I teach English as a second language, <clears throat> and um, and it. So by doing that, I um, realized that I really like helping people settle into this country. But I I do it by helping them be independent because they can't really settle in if people are helping them all the time. They have to learn to do it themselves. Thank you. Fran, I think you were next. Yeah, my uh, mine comes out of my lifelong work. Um, and I think it's just an extension of that. Um, I've always wanted to be a teacher. My profession was being a professor. And I see teaching as both my profession and avocation. Um, and so what I continue to do is to mentor, mentor young people, um, students still who come to me, parents who have kids who need advice about various things. Um, so uh, I, I think that's part of it. And also whenever I'm asked to teach or present something, um, you know, again, coming from my background, I love doing that. I've taught a number of Torah classes at Beth Haim where I converted. I've done um, a class at Shavuot uh, at TJC. I've given a couple of Devar Torah I think that's not the plural, right? Um, but so in that capacity that I've had, I try to give that now in a different context. Okay, so teaching, teaching, mentoring. Um, who is next? Jump in, your signature mitzvah and how it became that. Michael, then uh, Allison, I see. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it my signature mitzvah because it's generally what I do. What I've done is 
caring, supportive, helping people through difficult times. Uh, and just because that's just what I do, I didn't necessarily see it as a mitzvah per se. Uh, one thing that I have been doing more recently, though, is I have a, a good friend who has become ill and has been um, pretty much housebound, and I make sure that I visit with him once or twice a week. Um, and how I came to that also is seeing that when my my father had a stroke and was quite limited, he had he had three or four good friends who would not let him be alone. They made sure that they were there and supportive for him, and th that was a um, uh, that that was certainly a guide for me. So that it feels like the second one is this mitzvah bikur cholim of visiting the sick. And the first one you said isn't a signature mitzvah. Well, I don't, you know. But it sounds it, like it is because you brought it up first. <laughs> right. Um, Allison, then Michael, then Jane. So um, I think listening would be my signature mitzvah. And um, I don't know when I came to that. I think that's just been something that has um, been with me since childhood. Thank you. Michael Golden, then Jane, then Lana, then Michelle. I know I, wrong order, sorry. Michael. So I, I feel that Judaism has so much to teach. And whenever I have felt that synagogue, it, it's very important to me that synagogue life continue. So whenever there has been a, um, a time when I felt that it might be threatened, uh, I have volunteered for something. So when Annie Tucker left um, as the assistant rabbi here, I volunteered to take over Bible Baboka. When the DeRoat committee was trying to say, what should the synagogue of the future look like? I jumped into that because I want okay. this to continue. So being there. And you're still doing it. That's great. Yeah, so, so being there when it's needed. Michelle, I had passed you by. So Michelle and then Jane. Okay. Um, for me, it's really praying um, with song in a place where I feel a strong sense of community. And that really started for me in, um, in Washington where I, um, I sort of was selected to be coordinator of uh, the For Bringing Chavra and it was, it was sort of a big change in my life, but it, it um, the, the kind of the mode of prayer was very much, um, the music was always a part of it, as was community. Um, so. Thank you. Jane. Um, for me, um, I, was, I don't want to call it signature, but my favorite mitzvah is walking the synagogue on Shabbat. And I can't remember how long I've been doing it, but um, so I would walk home with um, Annie Tucker when she was here. And um, and so I, I became uh, pretty friendly with her then. And, and it just gives me, because I'm not really Shomer Shabbat, but walking um, to synagogue gives me a feeling of Shabbat and it just feels really peaceful. And I feel really sad when every now and then I can't because it's like 10 degrees and snowing or something. Why don't you want to call it a signature mitzvah? And then why did you bring it up when the question was, what's your signature? Well, okay, maybe signature. It's one of my favorite things, but I have other favorite things too. Okay. Um, anyone else want to go? Yeah. Dr. Karp. Dr. Karp. Herr Professor Dr. Karp, please. Um, emeritus, by the way. Um, I think uh, with Mike and, and, and uh, Allison, I think in the same thing. I, we, I know I chose a career in public medicine and people say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Actually, it was very fine. It's a wonderful way to live. And yes, you're constantly helping people who have no resources elsewhere 
which is very rewarding. It's very rewarding to do that. And they paid me and gave me a nice pension too. So it's not quite, uh, it's, it's um, not self-serving, but it's certainly, it's something that's good for me and good for the world. Too. Yeah, nobody ever said that um, doing a mitzvah can also be good for you. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. good. Who's going? I'll go. Lana. Um, I, for me, um, last week I said uh, mitzvah meant like vir virtue. And so for a signature, uh, for me, it's like me being true to myself and being able to be available for others when I can. That's it. Thank you. Anyone else have one? Lee, I'd be interested in yours since you have grown up in and lived in communities where mitzvah meant different things at different times in your life? That's a great question, actually. I was thinking about what my signature mitzvah would be, um, but I guess sort of helping people and, and teaching people. Nice. Anyone else want to go? Freddie, is your hand up? Yes, it is. Um, I have actually one, two, but one is a little... It's actually very different from everything we've been talking about. Good. One is working with nonprofits to help people. But the other, um, because I have such a strong environmental background, is, is protecting the earth and taking care of the earth. And I don't know whether that's considered a, a mitzvah of some sort, but it's certainly something that, um, that, I, that I do a lot of. Okay, so who on this, who here by raise of hand thinks that being a steward of God's earth is a mitzvah. Read my newsletter article next in, in February. Yes, big mitzvah, taking care of God's earth. Um, shows up very early on in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, being a steward of God's earth. Yeah, big mitzvah, thank you. We don't, um, we no, don't. no, Mike, 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 we gotta let everyone go first. Hold on. Yeah, who hasn't gone yet? Nancy Lewis. And then Shruti. Um, I uh, am a facilitator for an organization called Good Grief. Uh, we help children and uh, their surviving parent who have experienced early loss. Uh, and the children who have experienced the early loss of a parent. And I came to this because I myself experienced that at age 12 in the early 1960s when there was absolutely no place to take a kid like me. So Good Grief provides that and it's been an amazing experience. That does fit into actually one of the traditional mitzvot of Nichum Avelim, of bringing um, nechama, comfort to the mourners. Um, okay, there was one other hand, that, oh, Shruti. Uh, I'd say- Jira Fruit. I would say my signature mitzvah would be learning. I guess it's related to learning Torah, but also just learning about the world, learning about what people, people's experiences, listening that has led to learning about my friends, learning about people around me. And it's it's been something that I like the interplay between learning and then how I would teach and how I would interact and understand people. Thank you. Thank you. Has everyone gone once? Oh, Laura. Um, I love Laura's new to our community, but has, but comes every week. So come meet her um, at Shul on Shabbos. Yes. I, I love the question, uh, because I'm thinking for me, I feel myself to be in a transition right now. So I've, I've worked as a social worker for more than 35 years. And now I'm sort of like partial working part-time and having more time for other things. So I wonder like, what will... I would like some of that time to be filled with doing some other mitzvahs. And, and maybe that's even why I signed up for this class. But I think when you say signature mitzvah, it makes me think about how I believe like we all have certain gifts. And if we develop those gifts and use them to serve others, it's how we're being our best self and how we're helping with tikkun olam. So I guess probably the reason I became a social worker is listening to people is something that I, I love to do and I have a lot of patience for it. So 
I don't know, but but someone said about the earth. I, I love having more time now for hiking and outdoor stuff and hope to maybe do some kind of work with conservation. So I don't know. I don't know what maybe I'll have a new signature mitzvah in the next couple of years. Nice. Nice. I'm going to add mine quickly because you talked about changing for many years, even decades, my signature mitzvah, I believed other people would say was or welcoming guests into my home to help them learn and love Shabbos, Shabbat, around a Shabbat table. And then it all fell apart. A pandemic happened. And I went from having guests to every Shabbos to having no one. And so I had to look and find ways to have different meets vote. And so I think like having really good davening that had a lot of, where's Michelle, a lot of um, joyful singing that is deep and that is not passive, but um, active, active, introspective. Tvila with singing became more present for me because that I could still do. And so they're shifting. Definitely signature meets what things we're drawn to. So I want to ask you, do our meets vote that you have all talked about fit into any kind of discernible categories? So some of them, I'm going to are interpersonal. I think I spelled, I type, was typing quick and are about how we listen to one another, how you listen to one another or how you bring something one-on-one -on -one to someone. Maybe that's comfort, maybe that's education, but pretty interpersonal. Would you agree? But then others of you, um, we have some folks who work on advocacy and we have folks who do things that have to do with um, large scale groups. And that feels very much not, not that it's not personal, but something that deals with the communal, with the whole community, whether that community be the synagogue, um, Michael Golden wants to make sure our, we stay here or you know, our, our whole country, Sam Daly Harris or the whole world or whatever groups you're thinking through, you know, there's that interpersonal mitzvot, and then there's the com uh, the communal. But they also go a little bit larger. They can be maybe divided in other ways. What are other ways you might divide some of these mitzvot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jane. Um, wait. <laughs> there's the, um, yeah, so that's why I don't, like saying signature mitzvah because there's there's well think of it as shabbat mitzvot or ritual mitzvot prayer mitzvot then as you say interpersonal and um i don't know helping the community environmental there's just so many uh different types of mitzvot so it seems like you should pick your favorite in each category you can do that sure so I'm gonna, I heard a couple words. I'm gonna put some more words down. Some of the meets both that people talked about, although very few here, very few, which is interesting for us to think about are ritual, right? Yeah. Ritual. Very few of us chose to say my signature mitzvah is, I don't know, putting tefillin on, lighting Shabbos candles, something, something rich, even baking challah, something ritual. Um, most of us so far have been talking about interpersonal, communal, um, there's some other ones. How about liturgical? Either some people talked about a davening life, a prayer life. And then there may be other ways to think about meets vote. One could be inwardly focused and one could be outward focused. And all of these ways of thinking about mitzvah, Jane, you foreshadowed, are have truth in them. All of them, each of them, are different ways over the years, over the millennia, that Jews have understood mitzvah. So really, more than any one thing I do, maybe Jane, you're right, it's different categories. 
So one of the questions is, do we as moderns, or how do we as moderns see our world through mitzvah colored glasses? Meaning in, in any time I'm walking through the world, how can what I be doing be seen as doing mitzvah or Jewish action, God's action, spiritual action, holy action. And that can be interpersonal. It can be communal. It can be liturgical. It can be ritual. It can be inward. Prayer, in essence, lihitz palel means to focus inward. It can be outwardly focused in terms of creating a communal space for that prayer. It can be the the listening, the, the ear that listens. And Pirkei Avot, there's beautiful, um, the sixth chapter of Pirkei Avot talks about how one of the things that we need most is a listening ear. So those of you trained social workers. And then of course in the Shema, you know, Vishinantem, right? The, one of those larger mitzvot is teaching. So, and a lot of you talked about teaching in some way, listening, teaching. Maybe one of the pieces of modernity or modernity for Jews is that we don't necessarily see all of our work and our actions as mitzvah or qua mitzvah. And I would open you up and challenge you to say, much of what you do in this world can be seen through mitzvah colored glasses or as mitzvah. So I'm going to stop now because I have now maybe 35 minutes to do text with you. But before we go into these beautiful, delicious, gorgeous texts, I want to open it up to anyone who has anything they want to say, argue about, or make as a important point. No one? Mike has got his hand up. Yep. Okay, Mike. Uh, yes, Rabbi. What I wanted to say before is uh, uh, about the environmental stuff is that uh, I'm not sure if it's a Jewish expression or, or Native American, but uh, we do not inherit the world from our, from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Beautiful. Beautiful. Anyone else have a comment about Rini? also can be seen now often at the Jewish Center? Um, I, just, I just wanted to say when you talked about the various categories, yeah. um, I, I do light candles every Friday night and I do, you know, do a, a lot of ritual things, um, which are mitzvot in terms of commandments, but I think a lot of us define mitzvot as, um, interpersonal or save the world deeds. And so um, it, it, they're like, to me, two different categories, the mitzvot of commandment and the mitzvot of good deeds. I know, I know yeah. mitzvot means commandment, but. So, I think she's having some trouble with her Oh, you're on. You're on mute. I, I'm so. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got kicked okay. off. Then I'm. That's okay. I'm having trouble with our router, so I keep, you know, coming in and out. But I just wanted to comment that that um, when people mention ritual, I didn't even really think of it. It's just something I do. It's not something I. I mean, I do it very consciously, but. Um, but it's it's more from my heart. It's not because it's a commandment. So, but I don't know how to explain. Maybe it. those things <laughs> don't have to be different. It could be also from your heart to love the commandments or to love God in this way. It doesn't. They they don't have to be mutually exclusive. They could be together. And thank you. I think that some what I was hearing. And knowing some people on this screen now after being here a year and a half is that there are people who, it was so interesting to see what people chose, right? Knowing there are people here who do a lot of different meets vote. So it was interesting to see what people chose as a signature and how that can change. So uh, let's do text, okay? Let's learn from the text. So 
We're going back to the text that we did last time at the very end, and I'm going to go very quickly through it. Le'olam haba, in the world to come, a angel asks, Mahaya milachtecha, or Mahaya milachtech, if you're a woman identified. What was your malacha? What was your holy work? Remember, milacha is defined as work that was used to build the mishkan, the tabernacle in the desert. So work, and then work used to build the temple. Milacha. What was your holy work? And the first person comes up and says, Ma'achil re'evimani. I used to feed the hungry. And the angel says, Kol ha'me'achil re'evim hikanes. Anyone who fed the hungry, who that's what their work was. And you could say maybe someone who did food advocacy, that's the same thing, right? Hikanes, you should go. And then I used to clothe the naked. And um, the angel will say, this is God's gate. Zashar Ladonai, this is the gate of God. You who clothe the naked, enter. And similarly, a person who raised orphans, by the way, what do we, who do we call people who raise orphans? What's the other word for that? Teacher. So all of you who are teachers, orphans doesn't necessarily mean a person without parents. It's someone who needs to be taught something. Teachers principals, teachers, um, those who were the givers, who enabled all the great programming to happen, the myths of tzedakah, those who performed other acts of chesed, of loving kindness, all of you people, you are what the psalmist says, open for me the gates of righteousness. God says, open those gates. So the question here is, how does this text, this incredible text, I, by the way, I learned this text right from the horse's mouth, meaning right from the incredible Danny Siegel who translated it. How many of you know Danny Siegel? Yeah, right? Crazy mitzvah man. So um, if you haven't read Danny Siegel's books of poetry, um, please do. If you wanna, he used to do something called the Ziv Report. It's now called the Good People Report where he just, he and a group of people report on people doing great works in the world, but um, he's a great Jewish educator and a mentor, and um, he did this translation. And what do you think, why do you think he used the word occupation here to translate the word milacha? How would you, what, what's occupation here mean? Right, every translator has a, Thing. Why, why did he use occupation? Ellen. I, I think he's not talking about profession. He's Correct. talking about what ocup occupies your, your time. What do you do? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a job. It's what you choose to do with your time. Yeah. I, anyone want to add to that? I will we say mission. What's your mission? Uh, What's your mission? What is that thing inside your heart, your chest that okay. hasn't come out? I think it's more Isuk. Oh, isuk. isuk? Yeah. That's what what you are busy with? Yeah. Isuk. Yeah. Nice. Anyone else want to add? What is your calling? What calls you? <laughs> Yeah, so this text says, right, that there are multiple pathways to righteousness. What's the text asking of us? Pick one. You got it. Pick one. Choose one or two or four, but but pick some. Pick, pick some and be committed to it. it the text is saying, don't have it be a once in a while thing. By the way, I am one of those people I can say who doesn't love mitzvah days at synagogues. You know, people used to do mitzvah days because <laughs> A, every day is a mitzvah day. And B, if you wanna solve a problem in the world, it's not one day a year. 
it's figure out what the problems are in your community and then go work on them. Set Omad, go out, learn, and then go start, pick one. So some of you pick um, hunger and some of you pick um, ignorance, meaning to, to cure ignorance or to cure Jewish ignorance. And some of you pick comfort, bring comfort to others, but pick one or more and have it as, I mean, what, I, what, what seems so important about this text is the text wants us to hold it as something big and important so that we know you are known for that. So that, you know, I had this incredible teacher in sixth grade, Mrs. Packer. And when we were in sixth grade in public school, she asked us to write our own eulogies. It's kind of morbid. I think you wouldn't be able to do that today. But it's a really good exercise, right? What do you want the people eulogizing you to say about you? Like, what are you doing? What's, what are your things? So let's learn from the Gera Rebbe. The Gera Rebbe, 1871 to 1905, Rabbi Yehuda Leib Alter, um, the author of the Sfas Emet. I, I we translate Sfat Emet. He would have said Sfas Emes, the, which means the language of truth. Who would like to read for us? So Todaraba Myra, back with still dirt of the Holy Land on your feet. <laughs> Thank you. The Torah says, drink water from your cistern, flowing water from your well, Proverbs. God placed the- So, that, so that's the, the quote from Proverbs. And now the Sfas MS is going to talk about what he thinks that means. Okay. God placed a holy point, Nakuda into the very nature of every creation, creature. The Jew in particular has a holy soul. It is called your cistern, for it is attached to the body. The more you take this soul light upon yourself, drawing your deeds to follow this light, the more of spirit and higher soul is added to you. This opens the wellspring that flows without end. This is, quote, flowing from your well. Okay, so before we continue, I already know that in a modern audience, some of you are going to have a problem with one of his lines. So I'm gonna say it right now. He wrote at a particular time where there was a particular amount of particularism in the world. And he did not live in a world where he practiced a sense of universalism, meaning he wrote, the Jew in particular has a holy soul, right? There are a lot of pogroms going on around him. He did not live in a time or in a place where he would say that everyone has a particular holy soul. I think that most of us would believe, I believe that every human being has a particular holy soul. So if you can disregard that line, tell me now what is what speaks to you, if anything, from here. Yeah, Laura, but you're on. Oh, um, yeah, I would say I love this because they're kind of the, the writer is saying the good is already in there. God put it in there. You just have to let it come out. So it's a great um, word of encouragement to anyone who has low self-esteem. I mean, it is saying it's already in you, beautiful. And then he's also saying, if you can find it in you, the more you practice it, the more you will have of that soul light. And uh, for those of you who do, who have found, and most of you have signature meets vote in your life, things that you must do because it is a calling because you are blessed to do it. Do you feel that when you are engaged in that mitzvah work, you feel like a little bit more light in the world that you're adding more light you're, or your soul's being added to a little bit. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Michael. I like where it says this cistern in you flows without end. 
so that if you do a mitzvah, it doesn't diminish you. There is always more to come that will flow out of you, enabling you to do more mitzvah. Yeah, even when you're bone tired. So I'm looking at the community organizer, Sam Daly over here. And so one of the things that people who do that kind of organizing know is that sometimes you're really just bone tired. Or maybe you've taught nine classes in one day, Gila, and you have to figure out how to revamp the bar mitzvah program. Or maybe you've been in five different public health clinics and there isn't enough vaccine for everyone and you're trying to figure it out and you're boned higher, but you still, even with the tired, it's a good tired. It's a different kind of tired. It's a, your soul's being lifted up by what's inside of you, bubbling up to the surface, being brought to the world. Um, let's study one of those other great Rebbies. Unless, does anyone have any other things they wanna say about this particular one? Okay, could somebody read the Ishbitzer? Um, the Ishbitzer, by the way, is a little earlier, about a hundred years earlier. Um, Moshe Yosef of Izbitza, he's just known as the Ishbitzer, or the Ishbitzer Rebbe, and he's 1801 to 1854. Um, so you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your might. That, Every, you know, you all say it every day. Yeah. Everyone has a particular mitzvah by fulfilling it. That person achieves the world to come. And according to this mitzvah and its fulfillment is the essence of that person's whole existence. Wow. Thank you for fixing the gender bad stuff in it. Um, so what is he saying about this idea of signature mitzvah or particular mitzvah? He likes it. Well, he likes it. And he also relates it back to that beautiful midrash that what was your, what's your occupation? You know, you'll, how are you going to get to the world to come? How are you going to get to that Eden, Garden of Eden-like time? Even if you don't believe in an afterlife, maybe the Garden of Eden is the work that we do here. Um, so what, what do both of these Rebbe's say about mitzvot and personal attachment to them? Well, they say that the more you do, the more you become. And the more you live in a full way that brings out your essence and helps the world. Right, I love that idea that it's, it's already in you, in the cistern, and here that it's something that is the fulfillment of your essence and that our, our job, it's very much, by the way, it's, this feels very much like reading Plato. I don't know about the rest of you, but it feels like finding your arite, your essence, what you should be doing in this world. It's very Plato here. I don't think they knew Plato. I would say that Rambam, Maimonides did. I'm not sure these Hasidic Rebbe's did, but I, I should find that out. Um, but you know, they're, they're coming to say there are things that are just natural in you. What else does it say the converse of? How many, well, let me ask you it this way. How many meets vote are there in the Torah? 613. Yeah, 613, which of course, since the time the temple was destroyed, we can't do all that many of them. But let's say there's 150, 200 that we could do. How many, according to these two Rebbe's, are we really responsible for doing in a Meshugana type way? And Meshugana in the good sense, one, in the Hebrew, one. Meshugat Ladavar. How do I translate Meshugat Ladavar? One. One. I think one. One or some. Yeah, I think that they're reminding us that, yes, we are all going to be generalists at meets vote, meaning Rini. Is Rini still here? Yeah, I'm, she getting in and out, yeah. I'm still here. Yeah, yeah so um, that, yeah, you're going to light your Shabbos candles. I can't, I can't. You're going to light your Shabbos candles. 
and you're going to do 10 other things. You're going to make the morning minion to those of you who do that so that other people could say Kaddish. You're going to help resettle immigrants. You're going to do lots of things that are mitzvot, but you're going to do them. That's how Jews live. Jewish action. You do these mitzvot. And then on top of that, each of these rebbies in Poland 100 and 200 years ago are saying, but you're not going to be an expert at everything. But there are things that are going to speak to your soul. Michelle, I'm with you with the davening, with music. There are things that, or who, whoever's teaching English, I need you for the people, or whoever's resettling, or whoever's, there's a, a great phrase in, in the, um, in the, in the uh, Mishnah, but Michael Golden, that's your phrase. In a place where there is no person, endeavor to be that person. You live that. Robert Karp, your hand is up. My hand's up. This is, you're, you're, you're citing one of the great Jewish philosophers of the 20th century, Isaiah Berlin. Yeah. Um, he, uh, people, a hundred people are asked, what are the two, what is the, what is the book that you want, two books you want to take on a desert island? And one was always the Bible. And the other was his book called the, uh, the, the tortoise and the hare, tortoise and the hare, the fox and the, the hedgehog and the fox. The hedgehog, okay. the fox knows many things. The hedgehog knows one. And it's, it's just exactly that point of how do you find your focus? And it's a wonderful book, a wonderful essay, an introduction to Isaiah Berlin. So I think we're going to drop that at some point in the text, or maybe we'll have people be able to read that. We're going to move on, though, to a little bit of Martin Buber, because we're all another of the great philosophers of the 20th century. Um, so the Magid of Zlochtov, I can't even pronounce that, was asked by a chassid. We are told that everyone in the Jewish people is duty bound to say, when will my work in the world approach the work of my ancestors of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov? How are we to understand this? How could we ever venture to think that we could do what our ancestors did? The rabbi replied, just as our ancestors found new ways of serving, each a new service according to their character, one the service of love, the other that of stern justice, the third of beauty. So each one of us in our way shall devise something new in light of teachings and of service and do what has not been done. Okay, so let's read Buber's, the big part of this, every person who could read, who hasn't read yet, who could help us. So we save my voice, Mickey, thank you. Um, every person born into this world represents something new, something that never existed before, something original and unique. It is the duty of every person in the world to know and consider that he or she is unique in the world in this particular character and there has never been anyone like him in the world or if there had been someone like him there would have been no need for him to be in the world every single person is a new thing in the world and is called upon to fulfill the, their particularity in this world every person's foremost task is the actualization of their unique, unprecedented, and never recurring potentialities, and not the repetition of something that another, and not, and be it even the greatest, has already been achieved. It's hard. Now, none of these philosophers that we've, no, the Rebbe's or this philosopher that we read, think that we don't do other mitzvot. So Rini, I am so happy that you brought earlier that when you said, well, I didn't even think about lighting Shabbos candles, I just do it. They are all writing in a milieu of, there are things that as Jews we do. And then there's the particular things. So in the rest of the weeks that we're gonna study together, which I hope is many, we're gonna study some of those particular mitzvot. Next week, we're gonna study the history of mitzvah and if we have enough time, I'd love us to be able to get to the fourth session so that we have more time after that and begin to study one mitzvah. And I am 
really excited to tell you, Bob Karp, that that mitzvah that we're studying is Hashavat Aveda, the returning of lost objects. <laughs> so we'll save that story for another time. <laughs> I'll tell it then. <laughs> you could tell it then. But now yes. I'd love us, again, I showed you that book last week, Taking Hold of Torah by the former uh, chancellor of JTS. So, because we're not going to end here. We're not going to end either tonight or in our sessions thinking that it's only about one mitzvah or a couple mitzvah that animate our lives. But we do want to say we should have some mitzvah that we're better at. And you all do. There's a lot of social workers here. You've <laughs> taking care of others and activists and teachers. But maybe it's also creating incredible prayer experiences that Michelle did when she was at Fabringen or, or helping young mourners or acculturating new immigrants who are scared like we were when we left Egypt into this country. But it doesn't mean we're not going to do other mitzvahs. That's what the rest of the other subjects are about. Anyway, let's read our uh, Dr. Eisen before we end with a few ending points. Who could read Dr. Eisen, Taking Hold of Torah? I'll read. Thank you. Many contemporary Hi. American, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome, my pleasure. Many contemporary American Jews, I believe, now find themselves ready to take the step into or further into their tradition. They have come to understand that the first question facing them is not what they believe, but where they will stand in relation to the Jewish past. They know that Judaism is a commitment, not a creed, and that the key to revitalizing Jewish communities and eliciting Jewish commitment, therefore, lies in stimulating a live relation with the aspects of our inheritance that speak with inner power. Some Jews feel this address in politics or the arts, others hear it in prayer or study, still others establish a strong relation to tradition, primarily through ritual observance or projects of social justice. It is clear by this point, well into the process of Jewish return and renewal, that the future of the Jewish story in this diverse society depends on how the varieties of Jews bring the tradition to life by making it part of their own lives. Torah will grow through the range of concepts and emotions with which, Jewish, with which Jewish animate their reading, the activities which flow from it, the concerns on which they bring the tradition to bear. So this text actually, I believe, really is the answer to, I think, Rochelle's question from last week about how do we decide what is Jewish and what Jewish tradition is or will become? So anyone have answers to that or questions to add to that before we go back to this text? How do, how do you decide which mitzvah a community cares about? Yeah, Rini. I think uh, communities have to care about a lot of different mitzvot because we, we need so much action in so many areas that there is, I, before I said there was only one mitzvah that we're responsible for because of what the text said that if, you know, if you have a particular thing, you should stress that, but we all have different things. And so the community needs all of those things, not just, you know, make a list of six. Okay. Uh, yeah, Kila. I don't think the community has to decide. I think the person has to decide, and the the, the total of all the people and had this and their decision is the community. It's not the community to decide. Okay, so then, but I'll rebuff a little bit. Like you want to run a Hebrew school? I heard you used to run a fabulous one. And the community needs to decide, though, to put um, focus on it and dollars on it and time on it that, you know, community needs to decide that 
Education of our children is something we value enough that we don't care if we take a financial loss on it. In fact, we want to spend more money on it. Yeah? Yeah, but but that's not what it says here. This Here, it's what's your mission? How do you see your place in the Jewish world by doing mitzvot? And it's your it's your choice. That's what I. Yes, and it's all it's going to be. And I think what Dr. Eisen is saying is that because we're living in a world of absolute individualism, that what will come out are different kinds of mitzvot that seem to take on importance in the world. So I want to tell you what one that's been so interesting over the last three years. The mo. <laughs> I want to tell you, I am. I love to cook, but I will burn anything I bake or it won't come out. I don't bake, I go to bakeries. And it was so interesting to me, both over COVID and even before maybe, this sort of fascination with the mitzvah of making challah. Like it, it's, it's, for me, it's never going to be my signature mitzvah. Don't, I don't understand it. I don't get, I mean, I do get it. I get it when people do it and they feel like it's special for them, but it, it's so interesting how it really took over. Now we kind of know some of the reasons certainly during COVID why it took over, right? It was easy to do at home and it mirrored what the rest of the world was doing. Everyone and their mother was making sourdough with sourdough starter. So if you're Jewish, you make challah. It, it, it sort of, we, we, we see where it came from, but you're right, Gila, this is saying something different that like what is gonna be Jewish and what's gonna revitalize our communities are what Jews are interested in and start addressing. Okay. So what are some of those things? I mean, this already, you can see the curriculum was written 10 years ago that I think we are as a community dealing with a lot of them, certainly the Jewish center is. Yeah, uh, Michael. When I look at some of the things that the Jewish Center is doing, it corresponds so strongly to words from the Bible. So when the Bible says, help the stranger, we have a social action committee bringing in immigrants. When Isaiah says, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, we conduct food drives, clothing drives. Um, you know, all the things that we do are corresponds so much to what the Bible implores us to do. Yeah. Anyone else talk about things that feel like will become part of the Jewish agenda? And then are there things that are just not part of the Jewish agenda anymore that are mitzvot? We call them in the tradition a mit mitzvah, a dead mitzvah. Like what? So in our community, I would say that um, mikvah and shatnays are two mate mitzvahs right now. So these are really traditional mitzvot commandments. Um, uh, shatnays is the mixing of um, mm -hmm. natural items that don't get mixed according to the Bible. And um, mikvah is the, um, the laws surrounding immersing in a ritual bath, both for men and at times and for women at times. So they, they at least in non-Orthodox worlds have maybe, you know, I get some people to go to the mikvah before, I take people before weddings and I've taken people to mikvah before um, or after, like for a, for a significant birthday or after someone's completed a bad diagnosis or, Someone has a cancer scare, they may wish to mark it at a ritual bath, but going each month after your period, many people in the conservative movement, most women don't, right? I would say. So those are two examples of really traditional mitzvot that are part of part of the Jewish world, but not so much part of our world. On the other hand, there are other mitzvot that animate our lives that seem to be really important caring for the earth, um, hopefully educating the next generation. So I'm gonna stop because it's 8.10.
this is in a really interesting conversation. And I want to um, invite you to think about in the coming week the definitions of mitzvah and how they've changed. If you want to read ahead, you can. So also that interplay in your own life between those signature mitzvot, those mitzvot that are like in front of your face all the time. Uh, for Nancy, it's the good grief. It's the, you know, helping orphans, young ones with grief. For someone else, it's standing up and being that person. For someone else, it's being the listening ear. With integrating all the other mitzvot that we do in our lives and how we can see all the malecha, all the holy work that you do in your life as mitzvah. I'm gonna end with two brief announcements that I started out with, which are that um, we don't have B'nai Mitzvah in the next upcoming weeks. So if you wanna join um, Suzanne on Fridays to help our Kiddush crew, they usually get here at 11 a.m. on Fridays and you can help make our scrumptious, sumptuous Shabbat lunch. Mm -hmm. It's open to all. This Friday night, we have two programs going on. So if you know of anyone who they're appropriate for, at 5.30, Sharon and I are doing a service for people who are in second grade and under and their families. Second grade and under and their families, it'll be a 15 minute service. And then they are having dinner. Their dinner, I think their grilled cheese and tomato soup or whatever is catered. That's at 5.30 to 6.30 or however long they, they, they stay. If you know people who have kids, second grade and under and their families, 5.30, 6.30. At 6.30, Avi and I are leading services. And again, we want our services to feel really festive and um, and joyful and songful. So we hope you'll join us. We'll be starting out with a Ladino uh, Nigun. There'll be three different versions of Lachado D as all weeks that we do together. There'll be some sharing and we'll get you to dinner by or before 7.30. Dinner is potluck. We've had amazing experiences the last few months with potluck dinners. Um, you can stay on after and find out what you can make. I think what they ask is for people to make one side dish for at least eight people. You can make for more. That's even better, I think. Um, and make your best thing or, or buy dairy or kosher. And, um, and so that is A. And also Saturday morning, we are planning, to, Avi and I, to lead davening from different places in the in the building to get off from the off of the bima so that we can be with everyone so if you walk in and you don't see us on the bima we're there um we just love for people to come we want to see if we can shorten the service a little bit and also have the opportunity for a lot of singing does anyone have any questions um Rini, i have to send that as an email to the ritual chair i don't know i will copy it Thank um, you. I don't know who to send it to. Okay, it's Ethan Wagg, and I will send that. Send me your email. Um, does okay. anyone have any um, thing they want to say, say, add, something joyful? A nigun? Uh, I saw an email that came out that the Social Action Committee is running a trip to the South in the fall, so I hope anyone yes oh instead of me doing it there it is Rini. that's who you send it to ethan wag e wag um, oh okay thanks or i can send it for you but if you do it so um i hope some of you will come with that also if any of you are interested in studying this summer in israel maybe think about i'm going to be at the hartman institute the week before i go um there is a program for lay people who want to study serious torah it's the place where justice works and it's the program that he helps do. It's lay, and I can send you that info. And I thank you for wanting to study. Anyone have anything they want to say, add? Najat, great to see you back. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't say much today, but I was listening. It's because um, it made me realize that I 
didn't have a signature uh, mitzvah, you know. Yet. But I'm going to have one. Yeah. I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> um, Sharuthi, you're in California. We send our love to you. It's great to see everybody back. And I hope to be in Princeton in February for a couple of weeks. So I'll definitely yeah. get to see all of you. Okay, good. And we hope that you end up, you guys end up near here. And yeah, we're uh, waiting on hearing from that in the next month or so. Good luck, good luck. And Helene Isaacs, is your hand raised? It is. So one of the things I found interesting in the conversation was the discussion about individual meets vote versus community. And, you know, Gila's point that if we each do our own thing, then collectively we are a community. And having, I'm not active in the social action committee now, but I was years ago and having chaired that committee, you know, I think one of the absolute strengths and also one of the challenges is that it's a collection of people who are totally driven by their individual passions and collectively they do great work, but not everybody's doing the same thing. So sometimes that's a challenge if you're trying to get focus on one thing, but it's also one of the beauties of that committee and of the work that everybody is so, so passionate about. Yeah, and I think that one of my goals, which I know I've spoken with you about, is that we actually build that community differently so that it both has its individual focus, but that the community can own some of a little bit more of what it does. Right, we, so it's a strength and a challenge. <laughs> right, it's a strength that people have those interests. And now, you know, it's time that the Jewish Center own the identity of some of the great work that we all do. So, um, and own some more projects. Um, and, and have those projects be a little bit more front and forward focused. So Allison, how long have you guys been resettling refugees in the Princeton area? Since, well, for many, many years in, um, in the 60s it began. And during, when the Russian Jews came in the 80s, that as well. And then this group has been active since 2015 when the Syrians started coming which is just amazing. And we want, you know, the community, there's a lot of people involved or, or a t there's a tight group of people involved. And, and we wanna expand that and have it become even more of a, a presence at the Jewish center. We're we thrilled love, we would welcome more, more people's involvement. In, I mean, look, in, we're in thrilled. Ways. Look, we are thrilled that this past summer we're able to help resettle to folks who are um, not refugees, but who are political asylum seekers. And that's a different kind of project mm -hmm. because they actually are now part of our community. Yeah, that's a, that's a very that's wonderful one. Mm -hmm. um, well, you had asked, Rabbi, this is on a different topic, but you had asked a moment ago about something joyful at the end. And I, yeah. I, will, I will say that I'm gonna ask you to, to speak with, with Avi um, perhaps last night at the Martin Luther King service where a number of us um, yeah. and, and totally were filled with joy from, from, the, from the speeches and the music. Um, there's a lovely song that the Interfaith Choir sang on Hope. And um, I thought it was just a, it was a beautiful song and, and I'm sure um, Avi still has the booklet. And um, yeah, that would be- I beg your pardon? Yes, he showed it to me. He showed, yeah. Um, I think it would be a, a wonderful addition to, to our, our wonderful song fest on Friday night and Saturday morning. Well, I will tell you, Allison, the next song that's going to happen, though, is that Yonatan and Esau have been in the Hebrew school teaching kids their Adon Olam. Oh, that's great. Wow. That, that'll be happening at some point. Um, so, great. anyone have anything else? Okay, um, have a great week. And Lee, if you and Andrea are ever in the area, we'd love to see you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, Thank you, you good night. Thank you, Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Leila Tov, everyone. Leila Tov. Leila Tov. Yeah.